Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod episode 56. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante back in our offices. Dave was out here for our big event we had in Palo Alto. Dave, great to see you. Hey, episode John. Episode 56. I feel week. like I just saw you like hours ago. <laughs> He's got the red eye. I don't know how you do the red eye. You like we were two and a half hours delayed last night. So I was like, my yeah. eyes were crossed. <laughs> and, the, and the flight attendant, you know, red eyes are supposed to be quiet. The flight attendants were yapping the whole time cackling yeah like they're all energetic i'm like yeah. quiet yeah, up yeah, there turn yeah no meal service keep the windows closed come on <laughs> <laughs> take another shot of whiskey <laughs> you know? yeah. red eyes are hard i don't know how you do you're, you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed i don't know how you do it um but uh, what a great week we had a, another super studio performance in palo alto cube studios awesome ibm storage co-production really was awesome um we watched parties all around the world but what a great week for news i mean Action packed. So just doing the rundown, just like some serious major stuff going down, Dave. Bite dance, okay, which is TikTok. Okay, Congress legislation goes to the Senate, goes to Joe Biden, it's signed, and essentially they are banning TikTok, and that's going crazy. And we're gonna get in, in, into the China response and what that means. And and is that even wor worth going after it versus other things like Huawei and other things they want to fight for? US, meanwhile, shutting down drones in our communication networks, DJ One. That is a Chinese company that puts them out of business. So, you know, again, the China U.S. Um, national security posturing, um, an actual cold war is going on. It's going to be interesting to see this DJ One drones running on the U.S. That's going to be essentially putting a Chinese company out of business. So, okay, after TikTok get the drone banned, what's next? Huge China issue, of course. Other international kind of stuff going on inside the U.S. is the Palestinian protest, which is crushing the universities that went down net neutrality is resurrected from trump back. bandits back to back some people are going crazy some people are saying it's too late it's, it's a decade too long it re modernizes some people are cheering we're gonna we'll try to figure that out um no more non-competes lena khan essentially says hey non-competes are over lena khan bringing <laughs> killing non-competes actually david you, you should be happy about that so i finally something she did good or, well, or, I, or is I it i mean the well, I guess, I guess, but does she have the authority to even do that? Like, how, how can she just do that with a wave of a wand? Yeah, what else is she going to take away? I like know, free speech? Hey, <laughs> I mean, is that next? Biden, Biden <laughs> wants to have uh, capital gain, long-term capital gains tax of like 45%. The tech industry is going berserk, Gabe, berserk. It's crazy. They're going ballistic. 45%, uh, that, basically, because remember, for people who don't understand, I mean, you've already been taxed on that money. Right. We're, so, we're, we'll come back to it. Let's put I mean, a pit in it. Let's, it's going to kill the. Uh, it could kill the entrepreneurial ecosystem. It could literally kill. Um, it could literally kill innovation. Again, this is not good. Okay, so um, it's like essentially it will kill angel investment, early stage startups. Will kill entrepreneurship. Yeah, of course, it's, it's it's brutal. So, um, and then just the AI companies are, are are constantly in bed with each all the hyperscale cloud providers. Um, that's not really news, but it's kind of a dynamic. Um, well, but that's really important. I want to, I want to touch on that because I, I'm seeing signs of not exact, but little shades of 1999. Just keep, put that in the back of your head. I want to talk to you about that. All right. We'll put a pin in that one. IBM buys parentheses saves HashiCorp. My words saves from <laughs> PE. Your tweet was great. Well, they would have, they, there was really no other buyer. Rob Streche on Cube Research pointed this out. He actually was all over the story and he's deep in the, in the weeds, as, as we are. I mean, we, we, we interviewed when Vi, Vi, uh, Vagrant came out, which was their first project before he, even HashiCorp was formed. We interviewed Mitchell, the founder, in our office when we were in uh, one of our early offices in, in the Cube. Um, and so we saw the rise of that of that company. It's a single company, single project, single company, like Red Hat. Um, they really kind of just, they didn't have the juice. And when they changed their licensing, it just went sideways. But the, it's a good deal for IBM. I have a huge opinion on that. I think this will be as good as, if not better than the Red Hat deal, mainly because it just puts, it's a big piece of the puzzle. It's going to give IBM and Red Hat specifically a major element of the stack with Terraform and with um, you know, Vault which is a secret, has the secret data stuff in there. So they've done amazing. Their product well, will fit. And IBM will take the thousands of unmonetized customers and make it great. So uh, I think Hashi and IBM is a great combination. And, and HashiCorp's momentum was waning and, and they don't have a, an international presence. And the whole, we were just on a call with Rob Thomas and he was pointing out, look, the, by the way, this is like 
big for multi-cloud and cross-cloud. And you yeah. saw what I you saw what I tweeted on top of your tweet. I took some ETR data. The overlap in VMware accounts and Azure accounts is 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 quite high. It's like 20% of those accounts have HashiCorp. And the flip flip side, like HashiCorp accounts, uh, there's like 70 or 80% overlap with those two clouds. So that cross cloud connection, the super cloud, remember we had Dave McJanet in at Super Cloud yep. One. Yeah. And um I think it's that's legit. But the other thing, John, is they had a really good partnership with VMware, as did IBM. It's gonna be interesting to see what happens to that. I, I think it I think that just rolls into IBM and IBM as the cloud broker, if you will, not cloud provider, cloud operator, system integrator slash operating system is in mm -hmm. play. I shared two interviews that we did with Ar Arvin, the CEO, and when before he became CEO, when he purchased Red Hat 2018, I had black hair, Dave. I was you know, a lot younger than <laughs> <laughs> That was a good tweet. But but uh, you can hear that he's specifically laying out at that time what he was architecting and he's playing out. So the IBM six billion six and a half billion dollar deal for um, HashiCorp is uh, premium. They could have really got it for, for less. I mean, HashiCorp was diving into private equities arms and that would have been a complete dismantling yard sale and they would have essentially probably been rebooted in some other combination. But for IBM, they really saved the value of HashiCorp, which is well known and frankly has a lot of fans outside of the debacle at their license, which they had no kind of no choice, but they 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 had they were dying anyway. And, and so that's not a dying, big number though. It, so that's a big number. I it's, mean it's worth it. And they have a lot of infrastructure as code. And, and then Ansible. and then and then the Ansible uh, overlap is also huge. It's like fifty percent of the accounts uh, there, uh, have have e each each tool. So I think there's some real synergies. There. I think a lot of people were thinking that they were competitive, but I I don't think that's correct. I think Ansible is like you know the orchestration and planning layer, and and then Hashi use HashiCorp to do you know uh, infrastructure as code and and actually execute it tactically. Hashi HashiCorp made some I think in following their career from the beginning. I think the founders made some operational moves that probably if they had mulligans, they would change over again. Like they didn't, they weren't as collaborative as they could be in the industry because they had, they had the product, they had Terraform, then they had, they made a better product. By the time they had all this traction, they just didn't have the revenue growth and they put all their money into R and D and go to market. And as they spent more, they lost more and they didn't have a recurring revenue model. And that was really what killed them. And I think not having a collaborative ecosystem, um, forced them to the license change and that was a hail mary ended up ended up kind of killing them but you got a feel for the founders uh michelin armon they built they didn't get to build a durable company which you always want to do as a founder and they weren't really in it for the money because i mean they're rich now but like that, that they those founders were not in it for the like to be rich now they're rich now for the results but they were in it for the durable company they had a good culture again they could have been more collaborative that was my only critical analysis of them but they didn't build a durable company and that's a fail fail for the founders but IBM saves the legacy of HashiCorp which I think is awesome for the founders this deal is good for the original HashiCorp team the HashiCorp ecosystem and ultimately IBM will get the windfall by monetizing all those thousands of accounts and they have four th almost 5000 unpaid customers so yeah, and and, and I, I think it's going to be a good deal we'll and there's that and, kerfuffle about the the licensing Tim Crawford had a post on LinkedIn he said it's a big nothing burger. Well, I, I honestly don't fully understand it, but I do think what's the nothing burger? The licensing issues. No, it, it killed them. It it actually destroyed them. That, well, that no, was... but I think his point was that the, IBM's got to sort that out now. Oh yeah, um, they definitely have to sort it, it out, and, and they and have an I opportunity. Think, but I think they do have to put some, you know, elbow grease into that. That's that's not trivial. They have to figure well, out I, how to I, make I that post, more fast. I post I posted my video from yesterday's analyst angle we did. Um, it's very clear to me what's going to happen. This is my prediction. They're going to open up, they're going to bring back the open source. They had that seed in C and D with um, open tofu. They just keep open sourcing the product and do what Red Hat did. Okay. Service it for customers. So make it free, make sure no one competes with them. Like what they did with OpenShift. When OpenShift became much more Red Hat oriented, became much more sales, became differentiated. It wasn't pure open source with OpenShift. They could do the same thing with HashiCorp. Keep it open source with open tofu and other things, and then just productize it in a way with Red Hat for enterprise stack. That's what's going to happen. And if you on the licensing thing, if you look at their customer base and what they did, it's pretty compelling on, on the drop of, 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 of customers. The percent change kicks in straight down first two quarters after the license change. 
And so they didn't have any growth. So again, I like HashiCorp and I think it's a win for the HashiCorp team and founders that IBM can keep the legacy alive if they don't, you know, blue wash it. But we'll see. It was one of my predictions years ago. You know, I do the year end predictions. We we use the ETR data. It was like we could see HashiCorp. Like just pre IPO, we could see them on the rise. And then Stu and I <clears throat> did some analysis and, and, you know, they were looking good, but like you said, um, they didn't really have a future without, <laughs> without a big partner like IBM and, you know, PE would have been. Mm, All right. So going back down, like let's go and look at, we're going to come back to circle these key items. Some Network. other big news here. I mean, yeah. Microsoft, yeah. Google, Earnings, I mean, Meta. Uh, it, Microsoft, Google, Intel, Meta, ServiceNow, all having good earnings except for Intel. Intel, Dave, is the worst performing S&P 500 stock in 2024. Okay. Well, let's talk about Intel. I mean, and they beat EPS, but they missed revenue. And I saw all the tweets, oh, they, they, it's okay, they're coming back. It's like, if I yeah. may, I mean, Pat Gelsinger on the call, he said that he acknowledged that market demand was somewhat weaker than expected. So that's a concern. Yeah. Gross margin concerns. They had a drop in. They have a. They 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 are forecasting a drop in gross margins in Q2, even though they're saying they're going to have rising revenues. And Zinsser said, "Well, this is because it's significant startup costs." But you know, they expect margin expansion later in the yeah. year, but that's dependent on revenue growth. And and but you have an X86 market that basically is under fire. The TAM is not expanding. You got you, you got uh, AI chips squeezing them. You got ARM squeezing them. You got their CPU market share getting squeezed. You got the foundry business challenges. And so my take on this, John, is you got a hockey stick forecast, which is hoping yeah. for revenue growth in the second half and into 2025. But all this does is it puts more risk into Intel. And I think yeah. what's going to happen here, John, I do think they're going to have a little uptick from the PC cycle. And I think there's going to be a lot of, see, we told you so, Intel's back and investors are going to pour back in. And I think it's going to be a dead cat bounce. And I think the structural changes that are going on in the industry that are fundamentally challenging Intel's business model are going to really expose themselves in the 25, 26 timeframe in the, in the latter part of this decade. Yeah. And my prediction is it's going to get get really ugly. And you know, like I've said before, I hope I'm wrong, but I, yeah. I just I can wrong. see it. I've wrong. seen this before. Look, I know. But first of all, you're not wrong. And first of all, the CNBC's headline is essentially is about what we've been saying for over a year. Unlike those other analysts that have paid to say good things about Intel. Oh, there's a tailwind. Earnings are good. It's a top line bump. It's a, it's a no, they, they're horrible. Okay. Intel's Intel's uh, the worst performing stock in, in 2024. Okay. And, and here's the headline on CNBC today. Okay. This is the actual headline. Okay. Um, when you look at when you look at what, what the what the headline is, Intel falls as weak um, PC chip demand. No, that's PC. That's Reuters. Okay, boom, 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 boom. Okay, in. So while you're looking in, for in, it, Intel, Intel used to dominate the U.S. chip industry. Now it's struggling to stay relevant. That is the quote on CNBC today. To me, that is what we've been saying. And again, we're cheering for Intel. We love Pat Gelsinger. We've seen Pat Gelsinger do it at VMware. Remember when he was, um, they thought they were, gonna, they were gonna fire him and he had that big turnaround. He had that great keynote and then he was mo moving down the, moved, pivoted from there. He has yeah. an opportunity here. So um, what, what thing uh, is though, John, when when monopolies unravel, it especially in hardware, it gets really ugly. Like when Microsoft's monopoly unraveled, they had so much cash flow from their their applications business and uh, you know their PC operating system it didn't matter but when it's when it comes into hardware and you get these major transitions you lose you, your margins get squeezed it didn't happen in software to Microsoft their margins stayed at you know near yeah. near hundred percent it's not the case for Intel their margins just keep getting squeezed you know deeper deeper and they have to you have to put so much R and D in to stay competitive. It's just, and they're so x86 dependent now. I made this point, I think, in one of the earlier Cube pods. For Foundry to work, they need volume. And PC volumes, IDC says, growing in the low single digits, maybe one and a half percent this year. So how is Intel going to increase its volume? Because the vast majority, like all of its its volume in Foundry is from its captive business. And they tout that they've got all these customers. What What is Microsoft going to make one chip? With Intel Foundry, there's not, there's no volume from all these customers. This is just a, 
this is just marketing bullshit. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, you got to call it what it is. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's not you're not wrong. I mean, the thing that could swing Intel's way, and again, this is what I'm watching, and you you and I debated this before. The whole chiplet and the packaging piece could be interesting. So, let's see how custom silicon will roll yep. out, and and will that even be a factor? I mean, the Chips Act is another big news this week. Micron bagged over six billion dollars. So, you know, another another big chunk of cash going out to another chip company for the U.S. And, and by the if, way, if if I may, if I may, that's that's a company who will benefit from PCs. So, what's happening in PCs is units aren't growing, but the content is growing of things like memory and micron is going to benefit from that yeah and so the memory piece so then you got tsmc trying to get us going you and i were talking about that yesterday we weren't on camera i wish we had the cameras rolling but tsmc is their culture okay and the us competitiveness might be a problem why don't you weigh in on this because yeah, so uh, this is a huge power dynamic uh, in taiwan they're uh, they men they nailed the model, but is it even portable to the U.S.? And they yeah, have a so chunk of cash too from the Chips Act. They do. So Tom's Hardware had um, a uh, an article uh, that the TMC TSMC's labor practices draw serious concerns in Arizona. The company's new chip plant allegedly plagued by worker abuses. This is two days ago by. Guy, a person named Dallin Grimm. TSMC, not a hit with American hires. And basically, I'll, I'll just do a quick summary is TSMC flew a bunch of engineers over to Taiwan to in, in, enculturate them to like what it is in our system that allows us to be so awesome. And what it is, and we've talked about this before, these you know engineers in Taiwan, they drop everything. It's not family first. It's TSM first. So what they would do is they, first of all, it's like 12 hour days minimum, sometimes more. And the engineers and, and technicians are like, what, you know, we got to go home to our families. They're like, no. So what they would do is they would run these little, little drills and they would inject this like, like 911 call and say, okay, we got to have this done in two days. Like they do it on like on a Friday afternoon. So we got to work the weekend and people would be like, wait a minute. No, I got plans this weekend. They're like, drop them. This is how we roll. That's. Oh, it's been a big backlash. And so the point is, this is what Morris Chang has been saying for years, and he gave a great talk at MIT about this, is that the culture in Taiwan, they're like grateful to have these jobs. And Americans are like, screw you, but family first. And so it's just a cultural mis mismatch. So the, 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 the question is, who's going to get to one nanometer first? Is it going to be a U.S.-based manufacturer or is it going to be... Taiwanese. It's not yeah. going to be U.S. based. So here's an article from the rest of the world .org. Again, picking up on Tom's hardware. The American engineers uh, over the past month, the rest of the world spoke to more than 20 current former uh, TSMC employees from U.S. Number blah, blah, blah. The American engineers complained of rigid counterproductive hierarchies at the company. Taiwanese TSMC veterans described their American counterparts as lacking the kind of dedication and obedience they believe to be the foundation of their company's world-leading process. Now you got 2,200 employees working at TSMC's Arizona plant, half of them from deployed from Taiwan. So you essentially, you have tension between the two plants, Dave, simmering. It's a tinderbox. And, and what's happening is it's caused a huge delay in, in the desert. So missed deadlines, tension among workers. It's, it's going to plague the Phoenix expansion. So to your point from a few pods ago, I'm bringing this up because you had said, and we kind of both agreed on this, but you were really adamant that you didn't think the TSMC experiment was going to work in the U.S. when we were talking about them getting more money than Intel. Maybe Intel could make it work because they got the culture right here. I don't know. This is obviously data, real-time information coming coming out right now. So again, this, is, this could be a Taiwan-only product. I think, or, or is it? I think. I mean, what, what, I think what, what do you say? What do you think? I think. I don't think it's a Taiwan-only product, but I think it's very challenging for the U.S. to catch up on advanced production. And I think that so they maybe do, you know, <laughs> they maybe do well in fourteen nanometer. I, I just think it's, you know, the foundry business is a really difficult business. I mean, look what look what happened to Sanders at AMD. Remember he had that. If you're in chip war, he had that, that he used to run around saying only, you know, only real men, real men have fabs. 
And that's basically what's happening at Intel now. It's like they're hanging on. They're, they're fab hugging. I mean, I'm not sure they had any <laughs> options. With they're it. like, they're but, like IBM in the mainframe. Well, it, it, listen, there's a lot of similarities. It's interesting that you bring that up. There are a lot of similarities between IBM's unraveling of its monopoly and Intel's unraveling uh, of its monopoly because IBM basically handed its mainframe monopoly to Intel and Microsoft. And so, and and now we're seeing Intel, you know, face the challenges very similar to, but different, obviously different era, but very similar in the way that IBM was kind of in denial. And I think Intel in some ways is in denial I and mean, they're trying to do everything possible. And that, but there's just, the math's not working for me, John. It's just, it, it's just not, I just don't see it happening. I think the, the, I think the company is fundamentally flawed right now. I think its business model is broken. All right, I'm, tweet I'm tweeting this in real time as you're talking. Chip tension in the desert. Can the U.S. compete, or are we a bunch of lazy knuckleheads? CC Dave Vellante. <laughs> conversation. I just that's, that's interesting. <laughs> no, oh, that's the man. point. Are we a lazy bunch of woke knuckleheads? I mean, this is a serious issue, Dave. I mean, it's like, have we come to the point where we become so politically correct, and we have all these the standards are too low. Do we need a depression? Do we need another revolution? I mean, the Palestinians, you know, um, attacking Jewish students is ridiculous in these camps. Let me ask you, let me ask you a question. Down graduation. So like so, all this, it, these are people in, in, in the institutions, like putting all this, this uh, cultural like garbage out there. What, what happens to like making money and competing you, and winning? Did you, but, uh, so let me right, your question. Quasi, did, it's a quasi rant right there. Did so. you ever, did you ever, did you ever do that thing? Like the jobs I've had, like write down all the, shitty jobs you had over the years right you ever do that you ever think about that oh yeah cleaning right? toilets shoes yeah exactly you do Stop anything boy. Yeah, when you were 13 paper... 14 years old you do anything right yeah kids today they they won't do anything i mean some kids will you know kids that are you, you know maybe could come here from other countries but my kids won't i'm not gonna work at dunkin donuts i'm like what are you kidding me you're going to work. You figure it out. You know, I don't care if you walk dogs for pay. You're going to be working. My friend's and son so, worked at In-N-Out Burger. He says it was the best job he ever had. They paid good wages, and he gets to see all his friends come through. It's a social problem. <laughs> he read the cash register. <laughs> best job he ever had. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's, if we're too, you know, soft and lazy. I just, we may not be suited for that kind of schlocky manufacturing. It's going to be interesting to see, you know, but, but to your point about Micron, they're building facilities i think like outside of syracuse they've obviously done it in boise which is kind of you know great i love boise but it's not you know mainstream city so you know i think they'll i think we could do well in in memory chips My, micron's always manufactured in the u.s but listen there's only really two companies that manufacture leading edge you know chips and that's samsung and in korea and 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 tsmc in taiwan and intel's trying to be third and you know, I don't know. Like you said, the chiplet thing, and a lot of people say they have you know better packaging, but I think people underestimate TSM's packaging and the R and D that they do. Yeah. I think they're actually very good at it, and they've they've learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes, and they're really you know quite proficient. So I think it's to be determined if you know the whole chiplet strategy is going to overtake Samsung or TSMC. You know, I mean, obviously time will tell, but I'm not optimistic. As you know, I mean, I, earnings are a good sign. I've said, except for Intel and the chip stuff is really kind of tough business, um, but it's full speed ahead. I mean, according to um, all the top stories, Microsoft, Google Cloud, ServiceNow, Meta, um, it was a you know thumbs up quarter, Dave. Even, even Google, Google had a great after hours bounce yesterday, even though the S and P was down. But you know, a, a, Microsoft's AI cloud is crushing it well so azure by my estimates remember my estimates are revised downward based on the redacted court documents so i take taken into consideration internal microsoft email statements that basically indicated that it's not as big as a lot of the wall street analysts thought it was but nonetheless it's big so i got azure having about a 15 billion dollar quarter 31 percent growth which is accelerated from 28 percent last quarter and they're guiding to 30 percent again they said 70% of the the revenue in Azure came uh, was attributed to AI. So I figured that's about a billion dollars, and 6% uh, was last quarter. So it's really actually not growing much sequentially, but still it's a you know it's a four billion dollar run rate business. But Microsoft is a core holding for investors, and you know there's no reason to sell that. This company has a lot of upside. Now Google, 
It was interesting. I mean, I'm most concerned about GCP. That grew 28%. So think about that. Micro, and they're probably like $5 billion a quarter. So Microsoft is at least triple by, by my estimates, quadruple by some other estimates, the size. And yet Microsoft's growing faster, its IS business, than Google. So I got them, again, at $5 billion for the quarter. The story in Google is like YouTube subscriptions. See, Comcast is losing subscribers. YouTube is, is picking them up. I was on the plane the other day watching CNBC because the shitty Wi-Fi on JetBlue, you know, didn't work or the, the TVs weren't working. Lady next to me goes, how are you able to watch CNBC on your phone? I'm like, I got, I got YouTube TV, lady. <laughs> so I dumped Comcast. I got YouTube TV. Cut the cord. What do you mean? So that's cranking. And then did you see the CapEx? Did you see what Fitzy published? No, I didn't. He said he's got, he's got the CapEx stories shaping up. So he's got on the left side. Oh, on Google. He's, yeah, he's got left side. He's got Google, Meta, and Microsoft. And the right side, he has the clown division. IBM, Oracle, and Tesla. So Google this quarter, $12 billion. Uh, t uh, Meta, like six and a half, seven billion. Microsoft, $14 billion in CapEx. And they're saying it's going to grow. They could be spending $50, $100 billion in the next couple of years. You know? <laughs> and then IBM, you know, single digits, it looks like. You know, like I don't know, a little bit. Oracle, 1.8, I think. Tesla, maybe one. And he's got him as the clown division. He's such an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I like the, I like his clown car. And, oh, uh, he's funny. He, he's not wrong. CapEx is a measure, but he's got IBM wrong. IBM is not doing the cloud. They're doing something different. I think he's uh, he's missing. He's like piling on IBM. Dave, well, here's a little here's a little trivia stat for you. When we started working together in, in um, um, with uh, the Cube and Silicon Angle and us together, um, the stock of um, Microsoft was nineteen dollars. Nineteen dollars. Twenty ten. Okay. Wow. And then now it's 400 and change. It's a $3 trillion market cap. Google today hit 2 trillion. Okay. My Amazon's only 1.8 trillion. Okay. Only. So you got the trillion dollar club. Um, Apple, obviously up there, big time. Um, Amazon. I mean, I, I can't believe that, you know, Microsoft's got a bigger market cap than Apple. Okay. That, that to me is a shocker. And I think that is just great execution on Microsoft's side. Um, and uh, the question is, how much of it is smoke and mirrors? How much is it bumped up with the valuation? It's um, real. How much is it really inflated from the AI momentum? Uh, I know they have a cash franchise. We There's no debate on the software side. But is I think, is their market cap bigger than Apple because of the open AI? Yeah, it is. I think, I think you could- By a trillion? It, almost a trillion. I calculated last year- 750 billion was from AI. So take that out. And, and, but I mean, you know, then, then that's what you're looking at, but I think no reason to take it out. And just to your point about when we met in 2010, Nadella took over in 2014. And, and that's when things just really started to happen. A Apple stock was $4, $5 a share. Um, and when we started working together, so $19 for Microsoft, Five dollars for Apple. Let's go see what Alphabet market cap is. Yeah, so I mean, two yeah, trillion. Three trillion. So you go to them. They they were five. So we put if we had put money into these guys, um, Dave, if we just put a little bit of cash in, we'd be loaded. All right. I don't know. I I have my my money's managed by by some guy, right? Some firm. And they, they, I'm sure they own all this stuff. I don't really pay attention. No, I don't put money in stocks that we cover, as you know. But um, the the issue here is earnings, okay? IBM is going to look good. I think IBM is going to come out of this wave strong. ServiceNow continues to be great performance. Okay? IBM didn't have a great quarter, though. They didn't. No. I mean, it was okay. I think they come you out know, of it fine. They, I mean, they, they had an EPS beat, but they missed on revenue. You know, they grew one and a half percent. They grew three percent, I want to say, in constant currency. But they did have, you know, they had a nine cent EPS beat. But if, I mean, the, the, the stock was down 10 points because consulting missed and the outlook came down. It was, uh, they lowered the outlook to like five percent. And I think they at one point had it like seven, eight percent. Um, and then, of course, they bought Hashi. So you got the combination of the revenue miss. And HashiCorp acquisition, 6.4 billion, so that hit the stock. But 
I do think I agree with you. I think IBM would be just fine. The, the great thing about IBM is they're going to do 13 billion this year in cash, free cash flow. I mean, that's so here's, that's to here's, me the story. So they have the liquidity to do stock buybacks, and you see what happens to Dell stock when you do buybacks and 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 dividends as well. So, well, we got we got a big earnings beat coming up. You got Amazon, AMD, Samsung, Qualcomm, Supermicro, Cloudflare, and Informatica, and more. Got a full list. I'll I'll share on the in the notes. Um, other news: Salesforce is not going to buy Informatica. That that was a story that kind of went out early, but um, couldn't agree on price, right? I think they were just tire kicking, and I don't think Informatica wants to sell. I think they're doing pretty damn good right now. We're going to be at their event. The Cube will be there. Our Cube team will be there on the ground. Um, just a lot of stuff happening. Rubric went public. We know Bitpool. We interviewed him. I remember the first time I interviewed him, I'm like, wow, I like this company. And all the VCs are celebrating. Get the classic, you know, VC celebrating. You must have the VC self self uh, uh, promotion. Uh, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta say something here. Um, when Bipple pivoted the company to security, I was like, oh come on, really? And then you saw last year at RSA, they had a big, big presence at RSA, and I was like, hmm, okay, maybe there's something to this. And now he gets, he was the first you know, for cohesity to get to market, get to public markets. And I got to say, so I'm looking at this ETR data and the, one of the questions in there was, what else do you, what else do you, are you responsible for other than security? And sure enough, backup and recovery and data protection are right in there. Yeah. So it's a, it's become a fundamental part of a security posture and Bipple made the right call. Um, now, Look at their financials. They're losing a lot of money. They got to tighten that up, you know, when they start reporting on a regular basis. But hey, he got to the public market. Good for them. There was a lot of blue on Wall Street last week. The core DNA of their team really came from Google, Facebook, Oracle, um, people who built large scale distributed systems. They had good pedigree on VCs. Um, they, I think they just had a really good um, team, you know, light speed. I was nervous about them because remember they had the big shows. They had uh, Kevin Durant doing doing a big booth thing, and the uh, the Golden State Warriors were coming to their booth, and they were yeah. spending a lot of dough at the, at the the events. And they in Cohesity used to have like and and party I, offs, and then they pulled off the security pivot before anyone did. Essentially, now categorically, it's still the same backup and recovery. They call it cyber resilience. Cyber resilience is code word for security for data protection, which by the way is ransomware. That is a smart positioning play, and I think that that's the genius of the move. Um, when they when when that when the market went from we're not boring backup, we're anti anti ransomware because that's what data protection and recovery does. It protects you against ransomware. Yep. So you can tell them to go pound sand if they you get ransomware attacked. You can say screw off. I got my own backup recovery. That becomes critical infrastructure by pivoting it to the and actually renaming it aligns with the critical infrastructure buy, which is people are just writing fat checks. That people are skimming, oh, backup, I already got that. Oh, old technology, oh yeah, we have previous vendors. Smart move. And I think um, we'll see if if the if the catch-up, I know Dell's captured that opportunity. You know, we've had um, cyber resilience programs with Dell. Dell got it quickly. Dell's great at uh, getting back on the wave. They're, they're smart. Um, Druva, not sure if they're going to do anything. And Cohesity, I think might have missed it. But they got Veritas, so they can still get back in the game. I still, it, I still think it's really early, and I think Bitpool's going to be looked at as, uh, and his team as saying, okay, they paved the way. So I hope they're successful. They had a pop on the IPO. Uh, he's a true entrepreneur. I, had a, I met, I interviewed him in 2018. I think we go back on the Cube, looking at the Cube Data Lake here, Dave. We go back. And we had him on SuperCloud too. SuperCloud, he was on, and we had him on 2016. You know, way back in the day. Lightspeed Ventures came on too. I think they came on with him as well on an event. Uh, but overall, we're, we're happy. I mean, they're for looking. Him. They're looking pretty good in the spending data. You know, they they can, they come down from their high, but they're hanging tough in there. They they actually got some momentum. A little bit of churn, and a little bit of churn in larger accounts, but still, you know, yeah. ahead of cohesity. Yeah. Um, Let's put them on our radar for and they, uh, and, market and, research. And they're, and their momentum is is above pure storage, and pure storage always has had strong momentum, you know. So, yeah. you know, Dell's the big monster in that whole business. You know, Veeam, they've always been solid. You see Danny Allen left to go to Sneak. Did you see that? No, I did not. Yeah, so Danny Allen, does, 
What's that? They just had an acquisition. They bought Coveware, a bulk yeah, so, of ransomware. So, so and you think about capabilities. So Danny Allen was a you know he was a big time exec at Veeam, you know part of the Insight Capital team, et cetera, et cetera. They they were, mm -hmm. I presume he was. I always thought he was hanging out to do an IPO, and now he joins Sneak. Sneak's going to go IPO. So maybe he felt like okay, maybe they're dragging their feet. I don't know. I haven't talked to him, but you know one can only presume that he he jumped because he wanted to have a little. Little action on the IPO front, Peter McKay, right? They got a they got some momentum going. You can see that in the numbers too. Wow, great. Well, I, I tell you right now, looking at uh, um, some of the, the the security stuff, Cisco had warned of state sponsored cyber attacks targeting government networks. We saw the Microsoft hack. We kind of riffed on that that debacle. Z scale doesn't seem to matter, does it? Z Nobody scale Z scale Microsoft. Z scaler warns of AI's growing role in sophisticated phishing attacks. Google Mandiant reports findings that this is all in Silicon Angle. Uh, Mandiant report finds that uh, um, surprisingly a fall in time to detect intrusions. So people are having a, a, a longer time to get the intrusion data. And then just, just ransomware is up to the right. I bring that up this because I want to get that security news out there because you have a poll on Twitter. And you did oh, a yeah. breaking analysis on this. Oh, yeah. Sure. I, I really, I really want, I want to bring this up because conventional wisdom would tell you that people want to consolidate their tools and go reduce the number of vendor platform vendors, as Tim Crawford says, our friend Tim, which I disagree with him on this one point. He thinks it's going to be um, shrinking. And that was my initial reaction. But in thinking Me too, about by the way. Me in, too. And thinking about it, this 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 news around Cisco, Zscaler, and, and Mandy and others point out there's new attacks. So you have... Um, an inadequacy problem, and you have also a um, irrelevance problem, or or, or uh, not, not technical debt. We talked about in the pod last time. You have obsolescence. Tools could become obsolete as the technology changes. So companies who build technology for security have to stay current and relevant. And this is going to be the challenge. So share with you, share with the the uh, the audience what your results are when you did that poll, and what so data do you have to back it up? So our research team got together with ETR and because uh, ETR wanted to do a, a survey, a flash survey prior to RSA. So the timing is awesome. So we're, do, we're dropping the breaking analysis tomorrow. So I just had Eric Bradley in just a couple hours ago into the studio. We recorded our breaking analysis. He dropped this study. And one of the questions in the study, this blew me away. So the, the title of it, I'll, I'll give you the headline. It's security budgets are growing. They're growing at about 5% a year double the overall IT budget. Security budgets are growing, but so is vendor sprawl. You will not believe this. So here's the question. So 321 IT decision makers, and these are not like, the, these guys, are, these are real people. ETR knows who these people are. They're part of their community. They do a great job vetting them. So it's not like the survey is crap. Trust me, it's not. Over the next 12 months, do you expect to increase or decrease the number of cybersecurity vendors in your stack? 51% of the 321 respondents said increase. 37% said stay the same. Only 9% said decrease. And of those, only 6% of the sample said they're decreasing as a means uh, 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 through, through consolidation uh, to simplify their security stack. And it's like, what? All the vendors, Palo Alto, certainly CrowdStrike, Zscale, they're all talking about consolidation as their big play, but the data doesn't support that. When we ask them, like, why? Like, what's happening here? It's because we need new vendors to fill gaps. We need best of breed. <laughs> Our business is expanding into new areas like AI, like API security, like Edge, and our existing vendors can't help us. So, or, or their products aren't best of breed. So we got to add more vendors. Absolutely shocking to me, these results, John. Yeah, yeah, I was blown away. I think that speaks to a huge, huge challenge and opportunity. Security is never going away. This has to be baked in from everything. Um, it brings up why cyber resilience that rubric wrote on that data back on recovery every category is a security category in my opinion just like when we start getting into the ai and everything's got to be horizontally scalable with data everything's got to be embedded with with governance and security so i think the data governance and security are going to be the new what i call the devops movements where devops was infrastructure as code you just which was the cloud wave that was dev devops then you add devsecops security's kind of in there but 
what DevOps was for cloud and infrastructure as code, that movement that enables so much value. I think the same exact thing is going to happen with data and security, where it's going to evolve much more um, programmatically, much more pervasive in systems and change the paradigm. Because I think, you know, the question you asked Pat Gelsinger many, many years ago, this is security a do-over? It is in play right now. And I think you can't, can, this is unsustainable. Or it's just going to be a churn of tools just match up with the latest, greatest fashion of hacks. And yeah, maybe. It, it, I mean, it's either way, the signal of this means no one gives a crap about the number of vendors. It's all about the threats and the recovery. What's yeah. the blast radius? What? How do I contain it? Uh, what do I do for security? So that's coming up with the AI stuff, with the LLMs. People mm -hmm. are scared, um, really scared about how to integrate their data. So they, I gotta make you, they get sued. Or I not. gotta make you laugh. So two, two years ago, I was interviewing Frank Slootman about his book, you know, his amp up, amped up book. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, look, if you got 10 priorities, you got none. So there was a question in the survey, what, you know, what are your priorities for, what are the highest priorities for cyber? Identity, single sign on multi-factor authentication, vulnerability management, patching, endpoint, XDR, ED, EDR, observability, SIM, AV, Z, zero trust, cloud security posture, web application. Fire. I mean, they got all these priorities that they have to juggle. It's it's an impossible task for SecOps pros. So maybe AI can take out some of the human complexity, but it really hasn't yet. Not yet. Yeah, I think it's going to be big. Well, um, a lot's going on. Again, um, proud to see Rubrico public. public. That's a good win for Greylock, Lightspeed, and those guys. And again, the founder, yeah. uh, Bitpol, and the team. Great, great job. And it was good to see that uh, entrepreneurial uh, success and the grind. And let me, you know what, Dave, to me, what I like about the uh, Bitpol and, and, and those guys, we've been close to that, that journey and all the people around him here in Silicon Valley and the queue. The grind that goes into building a company, you know, all the hassles, all the, uh, the ups and downs, a roller coaster. Um, now they get to rewrite their story because they're now successful. The victors tell the story as the expression goes. But these guys worked hard and it was competitive. So great to see them hit hit the, the going public again, the beginning of a new chapter, going staying staying public, as we saw with HashiCorp is very difficult. So it's very difficult. So we'll, they, have you, to continue, they have to do did, that. Did you see Sanjay's tweet? Yeah, Sanjay Poonin was he quite said, kudos, the, kudos to the rubric team at Bipple, Sinha and board, including many friends I've known over the years on this exciting milestone. Even though we compete, I tip my hat to every entrepreneur that takes their company from zero to IPO, big feet, congrats from all of us. So that's a class tweet from Sanjay. I know he's and very competitive. He you means know, it too, by the way. He's, not, he's, he's absolutely, not, he's totally not, genuine. He's not, he's not, he's not like just, you know, optics. Totally uh, genuine, absolutely. Totally. Hey, why not tip your cap? Good for them. They, 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 and of course, you know, he wants to top that. I, I, we know Sanjay. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, okay, we're next, and we're going to top that valuation. Who knows what, right? I mean, which is great. We love the competition. It's very good for customers. But I thought that was a, a good a good gesture from Sanjay. A lot more non-competes, news, earnings uh, next week. Oracle's moving their headquarters to Nashville. Is that true or is that rumor, Dave? No, that's true. You, that's true. That's, you think, that's, you think that's, yeah, true. that's true? I do. I do because uh, Cerner. Healthcare. Larry is obsessed with transforming the healthcare industry. He's like, first of all, did you see his Cloud World keynote two years ago? We've been through many, many, many Oracle Open Worlds yeah. and Cloud Worlds. Now that they changed the name, and Larry would get up there. He would he would give a keynote for like hours, hours and hours. Well, two years ago, his keynote was like, I don't know, an hour and a half, and I would say an hour and five minutes was on healthcare. And he really knows his stuff. He he's dug, he dug deep into it. I think he feels as though they can really transform the experience for patients and doctors. And I think AI is is going to play a big role in that. So Cerner is is, is Nashville based, right? I well, think. I mean, I I don't really know where their headquarters. I know that he moved the headquarters to Austin. Remember during the pandemic. They're in that. Yeah, whole, they're, they're gonna. Yes, yeah. uh, Nashville's a healthcare hub. I mean, I didn't really know that. So but yeah, they, he, they did the twenty-eight billion dollar acquisition of Cerner. Okay, now they, if they're there, that makes that's a, makes sense. I mean, yeah, I, I get it. So, 
It's good for Tennessee. You know, I thought uh, North Carolina was a hub for healthcare. Maybe that's my, my yeah. Answer. I thought so too, but I mean they're definitely moving. This is going to happen, and so all right, Ellison's so unbelievable. I mean that guy, yeah. he looks great. How could you not? Like, how could you not like Larry Ellison and Michael Dell? Larry Ellison? How could you not like the guys that are still, you know, banging away? Michael Dell, Larry Ellison. Larry um, Ellison's there's... seventy-nine years old. He looks awesome, right? I mean, he's probably had some work done. You know, <laughs> he's a billionaire. Like, Dave, if we were billionaires, we'd be. I got no be, problem with that. He, he, he looks have... great. He's active. He's energetic. His mind is all there. I mean, he. Yeah. Think about Larry. Is he like really knows the tech, and he's got a historical perspective on this. I mean, he can go back to. You know, remember the remember when we introduced SQL? That was a game changer. I mean, he knows that yeah. we yeah. the Sybase was gaining momentum on us at the time. I mean, he's just, you know, he's got, he's an industry historian, a legend. Yeah. And the thing about Ellison, people love to crap on Oracle because, you know, it's kind of – Oracle brought it on themselves, by the way. You know, 10, 15 years ago, they were the company everybody loved to hate or really didn't even yeah. – just hated them. But but they've invested. Remember – you remember well. I mean, they yeah. kind of poo-pooed cloud uh, when he poo-pooed cloud, and then they – they yeah, we can do that. And then they were like, wow, this is actually really hard. So he had to rip it out and yeah. and start over again. But they've done it. I mean, you know, as and much we did, as and we, and, and, we did, on and we did a flyby the earn, uh, the analyst thing for the, I went to the mixer uh, Tuesday night, I think it was, and you went to the yeah, analyst yeah. thing on Wednesday. Um, and well, we had our meetings here, but um, Oracle's Oracle's got an opportunity, and I think big, you know, capex spending they got to get that out of the clown car to the into the into the good 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 list for Fitzy, but they they don't they have a lot of big iron, and the database could be a big advantage for them. So we'll keep an eye on it. Um, Okay, we're going to be on the road. So a couple things. On, the, on my my two youngest kids are graduating this year. Tyler from Northeastern and Caroline from UNC. I'll be in nice, Congratulations. May, the, the next, next, AM. next two weekends will be graduations, empty nesting for me. And uh, so we got the Cube's going to be at MongoDB. You'll be doing that event in New York on the 2nd. Yep. That's a great event. MongoDB is Mongo Not event. local. Yep, local. fantastic. At Javis, at the new Javits. Really they just keep awesome getting the developers, time. and they keep growing that commercial platform. Red Hat Summit, okay, RSA, Boomi World. Um, got a lot of action. Alterx and the NYSE is having a party with Cube on uh, Monday. Um, Monday night at RSA. Monday, Monday night at RSA at La What's the Lamar. name of that joint? Lamar. What's the name of the place? Lamar. Lamar. I don't know it. You know it, obviously. I, I'm going to post it on my Twitter, and I'll pin it. Um, and then right, also, good. also they're having a tech summit, Dave. So I don't know if you knew this, but 15th. they're having yeah. the 15th and 16th. They're doing, um, a, 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 a big event in San Francisco with Lightspeed and Salesforce. Are you, uh, are you hosting that? Are you, uh, like hosting a panel or something or no? No, no, I'm going to be, I think I might be doing some little cube action. So we'll see. Um, and then Uber, cube. Uber, um, I got invited to their AI thing. Um, the last day of RSA, the Thursday of RSA is down in Sunnyvale. Uh, our friend Uday is probably going to be there from Uber. So I'm psyched about that. And then, of course, you got, and we got Dell Tech World, right? <laughs> we got yeah. IBM Think. Del, yeah, Dell Tech World, Informatica World, IBM Think, and then it's Memorial Day, and then <laughs> Cisco Live, Snowflake, <laughs> Click, yeah. it's Databricks, Zenith, Zenith, HPE Discover. It's, you know, we're in the window. Uh, just a lot of great stuff. Also, I want to give a shout out to uh, I was in uh, checking out the New York scene and um, Lux Capital put out a really awesome um, directory of all the AI startups. I'll, I'll also I tweeted that as well. Grace is for who's over the partner over there. Um, for all the people in New York, you know, New York's turning out to be quite the hotbed. San Francisco gets the credit for all the most companies, but you don't count New York out. They, that's got a very vibrant community down there. And of course, we're expanding the cube to New York. So I've been doing a lot of research on the communities down there. You got um, Workbench, Lux Capital, NYSE. You got Insuk Ray's got Vertex Ventures down on the ground there. So you got a lot of enterprise players with nice communities developing in New York, Dave. And of course, you're in Boston. You're like Analyst Central over there at the with the, in Boston area. Still some good companies there. Yeah, I'll be, and I'll be in New York next week. I'm looking forward. I was lo I I I drive to New York. I I like going down there and hanging out, spending some time. By the way, if I could back up a little bit, you mentioned Snowflake and Databricks. Did you see Snowflake in, uh, announced Arctic, a 17 billion to 17 billion parameter MOE? Um, 
And I asked them, like, why does the world need another LLM? And they said, because we we want to stay on top of the innovation, and we need to um to, to we need to have our own LLM to really understand end 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 AI solutions. And I'm like, hmm, wow, okay, so that's that was interesting to me. I think it was all obviously they also they wanted to sort of compete with DBRX and say we're more open than you are and we're more efficient than you it are. It was a total copycat move for but, Databricks. But so, but but so, but why do why do either of those companies need to have an LLM? I don't think they, I mean, I think, first of all, it's fashionable to have one. It's almost like cool. It's like, you know, Jeremy Burton once says, no, don't, never fight fashion if you're in, in yeah, marketing. Yeah, good quote. So, yeah. So, so that applies here. So it's I for think, marketing. Well, marketing, and also, you also want to get your people start building muscles around this because Snowflake's behind on AI. They've always been. They've admitted it to them the cube and said, you know, not admitted it, but like they acknowledge it. Hey, it caught everyone by surprise. Their core competency wasn't in generative AI. Databricks had some open source, so they you can they got an acquisition through Mosaic and instead of Snowflake. So you got to start building the new muscle. So it's a great move for them to saying, good, good marketing office to counter get Databricks check. And then two, if I'm running product over there in engineering, I'm like, look, we got to get the AI muscle going, like the generative AI muscle, not, oh, we've done machine learning before. I mean, that's the classic, oh, we've been doing machine learning for years. Well, yeah, but now make it generative. That's a whole different ballgame. Quality, dealing with data sets, the power law that we published. I think Snowflake's got a real opportunity to go the other direction than Databricks, which is make it more data for the, their customers, make it about the customer's proprietary data. And, and and like I said, I've always said, the workflow and the data is the new intellectual property of companies. And so if I'm a company, I'm going to tread lightly into these new this LLM world knowing that there's like Swiss cheese, holes like but, Swiss cheese. So, But don't you think they need to have, L and Databricks too, this optionality of LLM to allow their customers to, to apply their whatever LLM is the right fit in terms of performance or efficiency or energy or model specificity? Don't you think they need to offer multiple options? Part first question, and the second question is: Do they is, do they really want to be in that business long term? Because it's so damn expensive to train these models, and is that going to be their core competency, or do you think they'll sort of fall off the wayside and let the anthropics and and open AIs battle it out with with the open source, with the let's, llamas let's, and the other falcons? And why don't we put that on our agenda for next pod? Because we don't have a lot of time to fish fish it out right now. But here's what I would say: We don't know the it's unknown. Here's what I would say might happen scenario. What happens after Snowflake and Databricks? The whole data lake thing becomes. Ah, let's just put it, encapsulate. Let's just get make it irrelevant. Let's let's make it not make it build an abstraction layer on top of the data lake. Let's just say they happen, that happens. And all kinds of open plumbing happens, open standards happen around connections and whatnot, moving data around. What's next could be a subscription model around models, you know, basically model deployment and vetting models, securing models, you know, software supply chain paradigm of data. Is the data healthy? So the, they could be an entirely different business in 10 years or a competitor will come along and they'll buy it. So you don't know. So I would say that I would bet the ranch that, They'll end up being in the data business, obviously, but in a different way. Data, data feeds, data data um, security, data latency, SLAs. So I look at that market as completely a land grab right now. And and again, no one knows. This is just scenarios. Um, but that would be my kind of blind blind guy throwing the dart at the board. I would bet on that. Because look at what does it go? You can only hold on. You either hold on to stuff, Dave, or you let let it go. There's two models. We see this in the media business. Oh, yeah, I got my my site. I don't want to give away my IP. No, no. The, uh, you you want to hoard the audience, and and, and they're gonna like like LinkedIn does. That's not a winning formula. Let it go. It's a good take, John. I mean, I think. But first of all, I, I buy the don't fight fashion. So it can't. It's not gonna hurt them uh, to increase their AI chops. I just question how many companies are actually going to be able to afford building and training. Uh, not a lot. LMs. That's yeah. going to be, that's going to be like a hyperscale market. How many people are going to be competing with Amazon? Three. <laughs> Four. Right. So if you're on the board <laughs> of snowflakes and data and, and data bricks, you're like, okay, guys do that, you know, flex your muscles, get, attract some AI people. But, but at the end of the day, 
let's let's have some other options as well and let well, them pay for it it's, it's other people's money for for llms i wouldn't count so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't i wouldn't count out the fact that one of them could be the aws of ai right the the place people go to like i've been saying that about meta has an opportunity to be the infrastructure provider for models and llms or, or ai for people it's like i gotta host it and run it somewhere why not be meta so i think snowflake could be that that player for specialized cloud for data cloud i don't know well, no you know snowflake's and, going through a major transformation right now they're they're open opening up open data tables they're open sourcing their llm right i mean it's it's they they've gone from walled garden to hey we're, we're going to open up yeah and so that's they got a, a, they, they got a competitor called databricks and a, a market that's massive and they have other potential competitors so if you it's a constant um chess game they're um yeah they're going I, out into I the love, open i love snowflake i love snowflake and databricks but the question is what's next after them well, that's what we've been working on with the six <laughs> data platform. Thank you for that setup. The more to be continued on that one. All right. Well, we did get past the bite dance. We'll come back to that later. But again, the Chinese, American, and European regulations, Cold War, Cold Tech War is happening. It's bad. It's not good. I don't like it personally. I think it should be global and harmonious, but that's me. Dave, call it a day. Have a great weekend. Good to see you in, in California. I'll be seeing you on the road. All right, John. We're gonna. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll be in Boston next week, and then uh, see you around. All right. See you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for the listening to the pod here, and DM us. Let us know. Go to SiliconAngle.com. That's where all the traffic is. The Cube.net is where the Cube videos are, and of course, check out the CubeAI.com. That's our small language model. Ask a question. Give it. Give it a test drive. Constantly trying to make that beta more productive, folks. So check it out. We'll see you next time.